Hello and welcome to The Pulse. From coping with the squatter settlements that house mainland immigrants who poured into Hong Kong after the Communist Revolution, to today's situation where we have the world's most expensive property market. Housing a growing population has been a headache for many administrations. We'll be looking at that in part two and talking to the man who helped to shape Hong Kong's post-war housing design, the 104-year-old former head of the Public Works Department, Michael Wright. But first, a founding member of the Democratic Party, Lo Chi Kuang, is the only member of Chief Executive Carrie Lam's cabinet with a pro-democratic background. He's here with me to talk about his new role as Secretary for Labour and Welfare. How are you finding making the transition between having been somebody who's been an advocate for many of the policies you're now dealing with as a policy secretary? It doesn't really uh, make a lot of difference for me. Uh, even when I was uh, with the Legislative Council, I guess I've been uh, also working closely with the government because if you want to advocate for a particular policy, you have to understand how it works within the government and how the government officials think so that you can actually propose a solution. Well, one of the first um, things on your list of priorities, I assume, is the MPF off offset problem, which has been going on and on and on. Is that coming to a conclusion? The present administration, in view of our fiscal health at the present moment, or in the foreseeable future, this is a very good opportunity where the government can play a role, particularly in helping both the employers and employees to come to agreement by playing a part in it financially. And what you're talking about, essentially, is paying money to the employers. No. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say that. Is that not right? Well, well I'm, isn't that the sticking point? It's helping the employers to pay the employees. The benefits go to the employees, the, not to the employees. The benefits would go to the employees, but the money would come from public funds. Yes, and from the, the question, society, yes. Is, is it not the question at the moment, how much? If you can't improve this issue, the retirement protection in the long run is still in big doubt because the, the, the offset mechanism has substantially weakened our MPF system. At present, we have 2.8 million account uh, or uh, participants, so to speak, but we have over 8 million accounts, which basically is saying that on average, each person has three accounts. So you are paying free management fees for free account for one single person. If each one can actually pay only one, have only one account, paying only the management fee of that account, you can actually say our management fees can go down by almost like two-thirds. That is a very substantial improvement in the MPF system. Can you just clarify, I mean, as I understand it, the, the current administration says old age pension, a universal pension scheme is out of the question. So what is coming forward? If, first of all, is that correct? At the present moment, we are already helping over 50% of them with the CSSA, the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, which actually providing them like $6,000 to $10,000 per month. Okay? Another one is the OH Living Allowance. We're, we're talking about now nearly half a million people on that scheme. Okay? If you look at all the proposed universal pension in Hong Kong, $3,500 would not be able to move them away from poverty, right? And definitely, if, well, the reason I talk about the CSSA rates, $6,000 to $10,000. The $6,000 is the basic living standard of Hong Kong. So unless you're talking about a universal pension of $6,000, but we can't afford that. Really? Yes. Obviously. Well, the, the reason, Nobody, the reason, that's why, that's why all say, the, no. Really is because... Because in, in no, the reason is very clear. Nobody in Hong Kong ever proposed a universal pension $6,000 because no, they all know it. All the efficacy groups know it is not possible. But okay? if it is possible, is it not in a contributory system? Well, in a contributory system? No. All the proposed systems, the major ones, has a contribution element, and nobody among the advocacy group proposed any rate over and about $3,500. That is a fact. So at the end of the five years of the administration, do you think 
30% of the elderly people in Hong Kong will still be living close to the poverty line? I can't tell you exactly, uh, but I would say the poverty gap will be substantially reduced. According to last year's Hong Kong Council of Social Service survey, more than half of the population aged between 20 and 34 are earning less than the median range of $14,700. Only 30% of them say they're satisfied with the economy and a mere 20% believe it will be possible to buy a home in the future. <laughs> Hong Kong's housing market is ridiculous right now and uh, we all need support a family in this die age. A lot of friends, they've already got their houses settled, they've got plenty of property in their name, so that's what's up. Natalie and Jackie are planning to tie the knot in April next year. A teacher and an engineer, as a couple, they earn about $50,000 a month. Like many other hopeful home buyers, and despite their above average earning power, they find it hard to keep up with ever-increasing property prices. Now committed to buying a more than $6 million apartment, the 25-year-olds reluctantly decided to skip their honeymoon trip as three-fifths of their income goes to their mortgage. At least my Tom According to the government's own housing index, the current average price of homes on the private market is 2.5 times higher than that of the previous decade. Over roughly the same period since the year 2000, the median monthly household income has grown by just 44 percent. Despite the implementation of a buyer's and special stamp duty in 2012 and the ad valorem stamp duty in 2016, there's been no sign of any weakening in the property market. Speculation and external demand remain strong. Recently, one developer floated the idea of a reverse mortgage under which senior citizens who have bought their property outright can use their home as security to pay off the mortgage for the children's new flat. The home will revert to the lender or be sold when they die. Some aspiring home buyers have been convinced to buy flats exceeding their budgets. Others resent such overly aggressive financing methods. <laughs> The楼,尤其是现在,楼,窗都越来越小,根本上,一个正常人都不会想在那里住,在那里生活,但是,他都要将这些楼不断地推销出来,其实,某程度上,他是想一些没有那么有能力购买的年轻人的钱都拎出来
誒係咪所有嘅㓥房都係非法，都唔符合我哋嘅屋宇啊或者消防條例咧，亦都唔係一定嘅。Two years ago, government statistics confirmed that some 200,000 people are living in subdivided units. A new figure should be out before the year ends, but it probably still won't tell the whole story, as the trend of partitioning units has now also reached high-end housing estates. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Last year, the government said that due to land shortages, it will only be able to build 236,000 public housing flats instead of its target of 280,000 by 2027. Meanwhile, the average waiting time for public housing now stands at four years and eight months. Later, we'll be talking to Marco Wu, the man who's been dubbed the father of the home ownership scheme. But first, Hong Kong's ambitious public housing program was born out of a devastating fire that made 53,000 people homeless in the Shekhit Mej squatter village on Christmas Day 1953. The first housing estates were pretty basic and included communal toilets and bathing facilities. Former director of public works, Michael Wright, did much to change that for the better. Nina Lowe caught up with him in London. In 1912, former director of public works Michael Wright is expecting his 105th birthday this coming September. He still thinks of his childhood in Hong Kong as a magical time. I was born in Hong Kong and I had a very, very happy childhood in Hong Kong. I was there till I was eight years old, lived in Magazine Gap, I had a nice house. When I left school, I, I qualified as an architect, then a case of what to do when I qualified and I saw the advertisement for a job in Hong Kong. And I thought, well, why not? I enjoyed myself in Hong Kong. <laughs> I got the job and I sailed on, I think, December the 3rd, 1938. In a run-up to the Japanese invasion, Michael Wright joined the Royal Hong Kong Regiment of Volunteers and fought in the Battle of Hong Kong. After being interned by the Japanese, he soon realized that poor sanitary conditions left little room for human dignity. During the camp, this time in the prison camp, I gave quite a lot of thought to whether it was possible to improve living conditions in Hong Kong for the ordinary people. When I civilian job in Hong Kong, uh, I visited quite a lot of what are called dangerous buildings. All these rooms were overcrowded. A family would live in a, uh, in a little cubicle about 10 feet square, with probably a whole family there, and no privacy because next door there was another. All sorts of people were living in, uh, up in these places. One big room and then a little thing with, with a kitchen. Uh, no lavatory. There was one dry latrine on the roof for the whole, for the whole block. It was disgusting that people lived in that way. After the war, Wright returned to public works, becoming involved in many projects, including the building of the Lion Rock Tunnel. His greatest contribution to the lifestyle of Hong Kong people may well have been that he insisted on standards of public housing in which privacy and human dignity were part of the design. As a member of the Housing Society and Director for Public Works, he insisted that each public housing unit must contain a private kitchen and lavatory. This standard was first implemented in the Housing Society project in Samshui Po in the 50s. Mr. Rice's Chinese name is Wu Lai Tak. Lai Tak Chun in Taihang was named after him. The right principle has been widely applied in every Housing Society project since then. I'm glad I'll be remembered in Hong Kong for that, if for, if for nothing else, because I think that um, you know, human dignity, it, 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 um, we should be able to carry on with private ablutions in private, not in public. And I think the government must be responsible for, the, for public housing. I don't think it could be left to private enterprise. 
And uh, I think private enterprise too in Hong Kong is not really to be trusted. I'll tell you two, two stories shortly before I left Hong Kong. The, um, I forget, a, a Chinese organization anyway of, of property owners um, opened, um, had the opening of a big um, office block and I went to the opening, they had a drinks party, the opening of this, this building. Now the new buildings ordinance, which was published about 1965, um, had one set of rules for domestic buildings another set of rules for non-domestic buildings. And one of the hosts, who was a very, very stupid man, he was talking to me, and he said, of course, he said, once we get the occupation permit, we'll be letting them off as flats. In other words, he had got the permission to get the, to terms of a non-domestic building with extra site coverage. And once they got the occupation permit, they were selling off, not letting off, not for offices, but for residential. And I thought, well, I, one of the last things I did to say to the, um, uh, when that building is finished, wait six months and go and inspect it. Because if it's being used for residential purpose, prosecute them. I think perhaps when it was a British colony, uh, the <coughs> most, not all, but most of the English people who were working there were really out working for the good of Hong Kong. I mean, there were one or two crooks, yes, there were, but they, on the whole, I think they were people generally trying to... Whereas I think now they've gone, and I think um, the, uh, I think the, the Chinese haven't got the same conscience towards the poorer people. I think it is... I think he's banned for himself in Hong Kong now, and that um, I don't um, don't quite know, quite know how to put it, but uh, I think they think the present government would probably shrug their shoulders and and not notice it. Whereas I think um, if it was still being run by the British, I think they would the, the Urban Council would stop this kind of racket of. Um, of um, misusing accommodation in that way. I Unfortunately, the, uh, the, almost immediately after his announcement, as you we all know, the, uh, there was the, um, the Asian financial crisis, and then following that, a series of events, including the outbreak of SARS, which really brought the housing market in Hong Kong, uh, particularly the private sector, into a big slump. The target of constructing 85,000 flats no longer existed. In recent years, the secondary market prices of certain subsidized homes in good locations or with good views have even exceeded those of privately developed properties. Sales of the latest HOS flats were up to 50 times oversubscribed. Marco Wu, who formulated and implemented the policies of the Home Ownership Scheme and later served as the Deputy Director of the Housing Department, has been dubbed the father of HOS. Wu believes the government will consider the affordability in adjusting the pricing level. We are now entering into a, a very imbalanced situation between uh, supply and demand of housing. And housing prices have I mean, grown up I mean, continuously. But now we are facing with a problem about, um, say, the affordability a problem, particularly the uh, younger generation, to be a homeowner. At the moment, this 30% discount uh, is part of the pricing formula, but it is not uh, sort of uh, inflexible in a way, because I think in fixing the flat setting prices for the home ownership scheme for units, um, the this discount rate should be flexible, could be move up or move down, say to, to fit in with the affordability of the eligible applicants as well. 
Over Leng Chenying's five-year term, the number of applicants for public housing rose by 45 percent. The average waiting time for a flat went up to 4.6 years. Hong Kong's home ownership rate remains disappointingly low compared to neighboring countries. I'm just thinking that uh, for the, uh, the land um, in possession by the private developers, particularly those uh, major ones, um, according to the news, um, it says that they're holding some, say, agricultural land at the moment up to some, say, over a thousand hectares, which is still not yet been uh, developed. If this land in private possession could be developed to a higher sort of plot ratio, but then in exchange, some of those flat units being produced would be for public housing purposes, like rental housing or even the home ownership scheme for sale, etc. So that could achieve a, a win-win situation. Well, that's it for us for this week and indeed for this season. The Pulse is off for a summer break and we'll be back in the second week of October. Until then, keep cool in the heat in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm.